Our first speaker today is Ji Luo. He got his undergraduate degree at the University of Cambridge in England. Then he came to the US and he got his PhD at Harvard University. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School. And then we were smart enough to hire him here at NCI. So he's going to talk to us about the KRAS oncogene. Ji. Uh, thank you, Terry, for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the RAS oncogene, which is what my lab's research is focused on today. Um, I, I'm going to show some data uh, from one of our recent paper um, towards the second half of the talk, but I sort of wanted to sort of cover, give you a, a broad picture of what's going on in the RAS field and how we're trying to target uh, this uh, uh, prominent oncogene in human cancer. So um, my lab's research interest is uh, focused on understanding the mechanism of KRAS-driven oncogenesis and to identify better therapeutic strategies uh, for KRAS in tumors. Um, so there are three members of the RAS family, so GTPases. I'll come to it in a, uh, in a little bit, KRAS, HRAS, and NRAS. And these are the three gene paralogs in the human genome. And together, they account for about 10% of, of, of all cancers. So uh, in particular, uh, pancreatic cancer, colorectal, and lung adenocarcinomas are the ones with the highest rate of mutations in the, ra uh, in the RAS oncogenes. As, as you can see from this pie chart, the lion's share of mutations occur in this one gene called KRAS, and that's what um, my lab's uh, research is focused on. Uh, and clinically, um, RAS mutation is a major challenge because uh, there are over uh, 200,000 patients, uh, we estimate, that, that would have a RAS mutant tumors uh, being diagnosed every year. And currently, we have no effective targeted therapies for the majority of these patients. So this is really a significant uh, clinical problem. And, and we think that part of the reason we currently don't have effective targeted therapy is that we don't have a full understanding of the oncogenic mechanism of the KRAS oncogene. And I think a deeper understanding of how mutant KRAS drive oncogenesis, tumor progression, and tumor, uh, tumor cell dissemination could lead to the development of more effective therapies in the future. So uh, this is just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I always like to start with uh, sort of a historic uh, perspective of how the RAS oncogene was initially discovered because uh, scientists at the NCI, including our, uh, our current acting director, Dr. Uh, Doug Lowey, had played an integral role in the discovery of the oncogene. And then uh, I will give you a quick background on uh, the, the, the oncogenic signaling network driven by uh, mutant RAS, um, and then talk about uh, the various strategies that we currently have to target RAS oncogenic signaling. And then um, I'll uh, introduce the concept of synthetic lethalities and no oncogene addiction as an additional approach to target cancer cells in the context of KRAS mutation. And then I'll talk about some of our recent works on identifying optimal uh, drug target combinations in this context. So um, the RAS oncogene was ori originally recognized um, as, as being part of viruses um, that can drive uh, tumor formation in mice and rats. So uh, these two seminal papers by Harvey and Kirsten uh, initially characterized uh, essentially mysterious viruses uh, that can induce tumor formations when injected into mice and rats. And at that point, it was just known that these are viral particles by filtration studies. And, and how they drive tumor formation in animal models was entirely unclear. And then fast forward about uh, a, a decade later or so, um, a, a, a number of groups, including uh, uh, the uh, Skolnix group uh, at the uh, N N NIH, uh, found that, in fact, um, these viruses encode uh, proteins. Um, they know that it's about 21 kilodalton, and they, it can bind to GTP. And it can also get phosphorylated and is associated with plasma, plasma membrane. And these, these, uh, this, the presence of this particular viral uh, protein appears to be associated with a transforming activity of the virus. Although back, back then, of course, molecular cloning um, hasn't, um, hasn't been easy. So, so it, was, it was initially characterized as a protein species that are encoded in the viral genome. And then a few years later, uh, through uh, transformation studies using both viral DNA and, and human DNA uh, from uh, cancer cells, 
uh, a number of papers from the Skolnick lab, from the Lowy lab, Barbasis, Weinberg, Wigler, and Cooper, pretty much all at the same time, realize two things. Uh, one, is, one thing is that there are specific elements in um, a, a DNA from human cancer cells that can transform a normal uh, cell, it can turn a normal cell neoplastic, and this was using the classic foci formation assay. And the second realization was that, in fact, there are uh, the sequence in the human cancer cells, there are elements of that that is homologous to this transforming uh, viral um, uh, 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 sequences. So, th so, so the DNA that these tumor viruses are using to drive transformation is related to the DNA in human cancer cells. And then um, just a year later, again, multiple lab racing uh, uh, towards this discovery realized that in fact, uh, the, the transforming gene element in the human cancer cell represents a mutated form um, of uh, a, a, a mutated form of a gene that in fact it ultimately encoded the RAS protein. And this is an important realization that lays the foundation. In fact, uh, these are oncogenic mutations in normal human genes that somehow have turned a cell cancerous. And then uh, quickly, a few years later, through very um, sort of tour de force microinjection experiment of proteins that are directly encoded by the RAS oncogene was demonstrating, in fact, this protein is, is itself uh, transforming because if you microinject mutant RAS proteins into a cell, that's sufficient to drive transformation. So this is a direct evidence that the human gene can be mutated into an oncogenic form, which then encodes a mutant protein that's itself oncogenic then drives um, the changes in the phenotype of the cell. And then a few years later, there are additional biochemical characterization uh, from these various labs showing that indeed uh, the human RAS protein appears to be a protein that drives uh, the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP. And the molecular mutation uh, in RAS protein appears to be a deficiency in hydrolyzing GTP. And in fact, um, uh, soon uh, the McCormick lab and uh, other labs have shown that indeed there are so-called GTPase activating proteins that stimulates the hydrolysis of GTP by RAS protein. And this circuit is broken uh, with the mutant RAS protein. So, so, so all of these uh, pieces of evidence uh, suggest a mechanism where a protein where it can normally be turned on and off through GTP, GDP cycle through a mutation is now broken and stark perhaps in the active state. And this is how it's driving oncogenic change. So uh, from those early studies, we have learned a lot about how the RAS, um, uh, how the RAS gene functions and what are the, um, the mechanism, how, what are the, uh, the, 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 the molecular biology of the RAS proteins function. So there are, as I mentioned, there are three genes in the human genome that encode uh, three highly uh, homologous uh, members of the family, H, N, and KRAS. Through alternative splicing, KRAS, in fact, uh, can encode uh, two different proteins, KRAS4A and KRAS4B, that differ in their C-terminus structures. And in fact, the vast majority of the RAS protein, uh, of the three RAS proteins are highly homologous. Uh, and then the, it consists of a so-called G domain, which is a GTP or GDP binding domain. And there are two stretches of sequence called switch one and switch two domain that RAS protein use to talk to their downstream infectors in their signaling uh, network. And then the C-terminus region of these proteins are more divergent, and this can, in fact, lead to a, a difference in their membrane localization mechanism and, and also subtle differences in their function. So um, just to summarize a lot of the studies over the years, uh, RAS proteins are uh, small GTPase, and their role in the cell is basically functions a molecular uh, switch to transduce signals from uh, extracellular um, uh, environment to the in, to, into inside of the cell. And typically, these proteins are activated by receptor tyrosine kinases, but they can also be activated by G proteins and other stimuli. So upon uh, receptor activation, through a family of proteins called GTP, GDP, GTP exchange factors or GAFs, RAS GDP, which is inactive, is then um, uh, uh, converted to a GTP bound form through, through the unloading of GDP and the loading of GTP. And binding to GTP 
results in a conformational change in RAS protein, and this allows the so-called switch one and switch two domain to bind to a number of downstream signaling factors I'll come to in a bit. And this can transduce uh, several forms of mitogenic signaling that stimulates cell proliferation and cell growth. And then normally, uh, so-called GAP proteins, GTPase active, uh, activating proteins, stimulates GTP hydrolysis on RAS, and this allows RAS to be turned off. So this is an on-off uh, switch that responds to the activation of uh, <coughs> receptors that tells the cells what to do. Um, and to, uh, to, for, to perform its function, RAS proteins first need to be localized to the plasma membrane. And this is through a series of processing enzymes shown here, where the C-terminals RAS proteins are proteolytically processed, and then, uh, um, then, then uh, farnesylated, and then, uh, and then palmitolated, um, so that a RAS becomes a, a, a membrane-associated protein through this um, uh, a prenylation process that associates to the membrane. Um, in the case of HRAS, NRAS, and KRAS, there are, there are two uh, lipid uh, groups that are added, uh, the, the farnesyl group and then palmitol group, whereas in the KRAS-4B isoform, the palmitoylation process is not utilized, but it has a stretch of polylysin that's positively charged that allows it to uh, interact with a negatively charged membrane for localization. And this, in fact, uh, will come to play uh, when it comes to targeting the membrane association of RAS proteins. And a large body of literature has established that RAS, uh, as a mitogenic signaling molecule, can talk to a number of downstream signaling pathways. This includes the classic MAP kinase pathway, uh, which uh, is primarily drives uh, cell proliferation, uh, cell cycle entry, as well as a number of transcriptional response. Uh, the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway uh, that's involved in the regulation of cell growth and cell metabolism, as well as protein synthesis. And then a number of other small GTPases, including RO, RAC, and RAL, that regulates cytoskeletal changes, cell motility, and transcriptional programs. And these signaling processes together form a signaling network that drive the various phenotypic outcome of RAS signaling, namely cell proliferation, cell growth, and cell survival. And you can imagine that if, if you mutate RAS protein to leave it in the on state, which uncouples the regulation of RAS, sign RAS signaling from upstream receptor activation, then this entire RAS signaling network is now stuck in the on state. And this, in fact, drives many of the hallmarks of cancer, such as uncontrolled cell proliferation, cell survival. So because RAS is such a signaling nexus sitting downstream of the receptor, um, as I mentioned, 10% of all human cancers uh, harbor mutations in one of the three RAS genes, particularly KRAS. And in fact, be, uh, in addition to pancreatic, colorectal, and lung endocarcinoma, many other forms of cancer have various percentages of mutation um, in the RAS family. And when you look at what residues on RAS, um, proteins are mutated, the pattern is very, very striking. So the lion's share of RAS mutation occur on three amino acid res residues, uh, uh, G12, G13, and Q61. Uh, so these are sort of your classic hotspot mutations that leads to um, a change in the function of a protein. And the reason uh, you have mutations that are concentrated on these three residues is very apparent once you understand at the molecular level uh, at the structural level, how RAS protein is activated. So what is shown here is the RAS GTP binding, binding pocket, and the GAP protein uh, inserts um, a loop, so-called arginine finger, into this pocket. And this, this interaction between RAS and GAP is critical in stimulating the GTP hydrolysis activity of RAS by over a thousand fold. And if, so this is how the cell can control RAS signaling in a very a tight fashion to allow it to respond to activation of receptors and then quickly turn off when the stimulus is gone. And if you look at one of the typical mutation where you replace the glycine at the position 12 with a large uh, amino acid such as aspartic acid, um, this GTP binding pocket is now occluded by the bulky amino acid and this prevents the arginine finger of gap protein 
from inserting itself into this catalytic pocket to stimulate GTP hydrolysis. And this essentially shift the equilibrium of RAS from predominantly GDP bound state to predominantly GTP bound state. And now RAS proteins are constitutively on, then it engages its various downstream effector signaling pathways irrespective uh, of whether the upstream receptors are still active. And this leads to constitutive RAS signaling and oncogenic transformation. So in fact, RAS mutation can either be a uh, initiation factor, uh, such as in the case of lung and pancreatic adenocarcinoma, where we observe KRAS mutation at relatively early stages of this cancer, or as a progression factor, such as in the case of colorectal cancer, where um, you um, mutate um, APC before uh, you mutate RAS, and this leads to sort of uh, constitutive activation of the stem cell signaling program, and KRAS now promotes the, 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 the progression from adenoma to adenocarcinoma. But nevertheless, you can see that KRAS is integrally involved in the initiation and progression of these various forms of epithelial tumor. And the reason, uh, as I mentioned, that RAS is such a good oncogene and it's, it likes to be mutated, yes. Right, so that's a really good question. So um, I think part of the reason, it's actually not clear why this, you have this selectivity for these three particular types of epithelial cancer. In fact, RAS mutation is almost never seen in breast cancer or prostate cancer, or many of these other uh, adenocarcinomas. And presumably the reason is whether different tissue types utilize the RAS signaling pathway to the same extent and whether um, mutating RAS is advantageous for the development of tumors in that particular organ in its native environment. Um, so there are RAS mutation, as I shown in, the, uh, in the, a couple of slides ago, at lower frequencies in many other types of tumor, but presumably um, these three types of organs really like to have RAS signaling as part of their perhaps normal physiological um, uh, renewal process. Um, and because RAS, mutant RAS can constitutively activate a number of these downstream signaling pathways, um, when it's mutated, you can get neoplastic transformation. So normally when you have uh, a, a monolayer epithelial cells, um, cells can only divide along the plane of the basement membrane. And any cell division that put the cell out of adhesion with the basement membrane will lead to cell death. Uh, this is typically called anuitis. But when you have a mutant KRAS, now cells can proliferate irrespective of their attachment process to the basement membrane. And this gives rise to a neoplastic transformation. And what's important in terms of uh, therapeutic strategy is that it has been demonstrated both in vitro and in vivo in that cancer cells with mutations in KRAS by and large are still dependent on the continuous presence of the mutant KRAS oncogene for their transformed phenotype. So if you genetically or pharmacologically silent um, the function of the KRAS oncogene, you can reverse this phenotype in many cases and leads to the resolution of the tumor and restoration of the epithelial monolayer. In fact, this is the classic phenomenon of oncogene addiction that I'll talk about in a little bit more. So, so this is important because it states that many tumors, even late stage tumors, are still continuously dependent on the function of a major driver such as the KRAS oncogene for their uh, un malignant phenotype. And this is really the basis of why targeting oncogenic signaling has uh, therapeutic utility. So uh, there are many strategies uh, based on the, the molecular biology of RAS signaling that I just mentioned um, that we could think about that RAS, um, oncogenic RAS signaling can be targeted. So, um, you can try to disrupt the membrane localization of RAS proteins, therefore uh, weaken its interaction with um, both the receptor as well as with its downstream signaling uh, pathways. You can develop inhibitors that directly inhibit the function of the RAS oncoprotein or inhibitors that target various downstream signaling pathways of RAS um, protein. You can also uh, go after indirect targets. Many of these we term as synthetic lethal targets. Uh, some of the examples are include metabolic uh, processes or auto, uh, autophagy um, 
uh, pathway, which I'll talk about toward the end, that are uh, altered in cancer cell in response uh, to oncogenic RAS mutation to support the malignant phenotype of these cells. So, uh, so there are a number of entry points one could think of to target uh, the RAS signaling pathway and its associated um, changes. But so far, this has proven to be quite difficult. Um, and, and the reason uh, is, uh, is, is, is multitude, but I'll give you a few examples as to why we still don't have effective target therapies for most of these uh, RAS mutant cancers. So uh, one of the earlier uh, attempt at uh, targeting RAS membrane localization is basically to develop inhibitors that target some of the enzymes that are involved in the C-terminus uh, processing of RAS proteins and its uh, prenylation um, process. Uh, the, perhaps the most famous example is uh, inhibitors targeting farnesyl transferase, which blocked the very first step of farnesylation uh, on the cysting residue in the C-terminus of RAS proteins. And uh, for reasons I don't have time to go into, but um, what, what happened with a RAS protein, particularly KRAS uh, 4B protein, is that when you block farnesyl transferase, it can undergo an alternative prenylation process called geronal geronal transferase, and it can localize to the plasma membrane through a different lipid moiety called, um, called a geronal geronal group. So of course, you can think about ways to develop geronal geronal transferase inhibitors to try to block this alternative process. But I think a bigger problem than uh, blocking these uh, prenylation enzymes is that a RAS is only one of over a uh, 100 small GDPases that utilize the same enzymatic pathway for their membrane localization. So you can imagine that disrupting this enzyme's activity will disrupt the, act, uh, the, the correct localization and targeting of many other small GDPases in the cell. So you would have a pleiotropic effect on the cell's function. So this approach um, perhaps lack um, specific selectivity for um, RAS family proteins. And so um, this could limit the, both the therapeutic window as well as the utility of such inhibitors. So thus far, farnesyl transferase inhibitors really haven't demonstrated clinical uh, benefits in KRAS immune tumors. Um, but there are newer generations of journal journal transferase inhibitors that are in uh, clinical studies right now. And then the next thing that we obviously can try is to directly interfere with the function of the RAS oncoprotein. Um, um, because we know how to block other oncogenic kinases as EGFR and BRAS. However, uh, with these small GGPAs, it, tr it turns out that it's very difficult to develop direct inhibitors that competes for GTP binding, which is what we typically do for our ATP binding kinase inhibitors. Um, and so uh, thus far, uh, there haven't been um, a good GDP competitive inhibitor despite decades of intense uh, pharmacological effort uh, to effectively turn off uh, the function of uh, the mutant KRAS. And then you can also imagine that we can develop drugs to disrupt the interaction between mutant RAS protein and its effector binding, such as the binding between KRAS and RAS kinase. But it turns out that such interaction surface is quite large and quite flat. It's really hard to develop a small molecule that can disrupt such extensive protein-protein interactions. But recent works from Debbie Morrison, also at the NCI, have pointed to really promising um, approaches uh, using peptidomimics as well as natural products that could potentially disrupt this interaction. Um, one successful example of inhibiting KRAS oncoprotein that was, in, uh, that was originally uh, developed by Kivon Shokat's group um, um, in collaboration with uh, Frank McCormick's group is, is basically to take advantage of one particular form of KRAS mutation, the G12C mutation, and develop a small molecule that could crosslink to this new cysting residue that's only present on the oncoprotein but not in the wild type protein, and then disrupt this. Um, uh, homeostasis of GDP to GTP exchange. And so this uh, so-called KRAS G12C cross-link inhibitor would trap mutant KRAS protein in the GDP bound inactive state and therefore shift equilibrium towards RAS inactivation. And this inhibitors have indeed gained quite a bit of traction. So this is one of the earlier inhibitors called ARS1620. You can see that uh, in animal models, it can really um, inhibit and sometimes shrink the growth of PDX tumors that harbor G12C mutations uh, in, uh, in KRAS, but not 
other form of mutation such as G12B or even wild type, KRAS wild type tumor. Uh, and more recently, uh, Amgen has a, a experimental compound called AMG510 uh, that has, uh, is working its way through phase one clinical trial and it has, in fact has demonstrated quite impressive activity in particularly lung cancer patients with KRAS G12C mutation. And this is in fact is, a, is, a, is the very first KRAS specific uh, inhibitors that have demonstrated promising activity in human clinical trials. The problem, however, is that these drugs, as I mentioned, only work with KRAS G12C mutation. And KRAS G12C mutation do occur in about 40% of lung cancers with KRAS mutation, but it's relatively rare in pancreatic and colorectal cancer. So uh, for the majority of other KRAS mutations, we, we still have no ways uh, to directly inhibit the activity of the KRAS oncoprotein. And then uh, uh, if we cannot directly block the activity of the oncoprotein, the idea is that can we block its downstream signaling pathways? Because many of these proteins, such as RAF, MEK, and ERK, uh, PS3 kinase, AKT, and mTOR, these are protein kinases, and we know how to inhibit protein kinases. So uh, various pharmaceutical companies and academic labs have developed quite good inhibitors that target various kinases in these downstream signaling pathways, particularly in the MAP kinase and the PS3 kinase pathway, to try to block oncogenic RAS signaling further downstream. And the reason the MAP kinase pathway has received so much attention is that genetically, as well as pharmacologically, has been well demonstrated to be essential in driving cell proliferation downstream of uh, mutant RAS. So in this experiment that's uh, carried out by Mariano Barbaris's lab, they've shown that if you get rid of all the RAS genes in the cell, and they generate so-called the RAS-less cell, it cannot proliferate. And you can put back activating mutations in various, um, uh, in various RAS signaling pathway components. In fact, the only pathway components that can restore cell, prolif cell proliferation are activating mutations in uh, the MAP kinase pathway kinases. However, it turns out that inhibitors targeting these various kinases in the MAP kinase pathway also have their own problems. RAF kinases uh, work really well in BRAF mutant melanoma, but in RAS mutant cells, it turns out that they can paradoxically bind to and activate wild type RAF proteins to stimulate rather than inhibit the activity of the MAP kinase pathway uh, at physiologically relevant concentration that can be achieved. And this really uh, had made these inhibitors not very good at blocking MAP kinase signaling. And there are newer generation inhibitors that try to circumvent uh, this property. Uh, I won't have time to go into, but uh, suffice to say that inhibiting RAF kinases thus far has not really been um, effective in uh, uh, blocking MAP kinase signaling in KRAS mutant context. And the inhibitors that target MEK kinases, such as this compound Tramentinib, which is approved, again, for BRAF mutant melanoma, also have not yielded good results in KRAS mutant tumors. And part of the reason is that uh, there is a natural feedback loop the cell uses to limit how much MAP kinase pathway activity it can have. So once you block the MAP kinase, you disable these negative feedback loops, and that, that, that leads to increased signaling through this pathway and therefore diminished uh, efficacy for these inhibitors. And this is one of the most recent uh, phase three clinical trials using the MEK inhibitor stelumetinib uh, in combination with chemotherapy docetaxel in about 500 KRAS mutant lung cancer patients. Uh, uh, the, the orange line is the chemotherapy alone, and the uh, blue line, dark blue line, is the MEK inhibitor cellulometinib plus chemotherapy. You can see, uh, in fact, uh, there's no survival benefits uh, for the patients on combination therapy. And this is quite disheartening, but it goes to say that, in fact, uh, this perhaps is not the ideal combination, despite chemotherapy being the standard of care. And we need to think harder about what are the rational com combination therapy we can use. And I won't, I, I won't skip, I, I won't go into detail in the mechanism, but a part of the reason we think that this combination wouldn't work is because these two drugs um, block cells at two different stages of the cell cycle, so you don't necessarily expect a strong degree of synergy. And then uh, other combination therapies that are currently on deck for clinical trials uh, could pose significant toxicity issues because they block fairly essential cell, cell signaling and cell proliferation pathways. And then the question is, can you get sufficient therapy window to discriminate um, KRAS mutant tumor cells from those normal proliferating stem and progenitor cells in the body? And this is, in fact, the key of what we think about 
when we think about combination therapy is that you don't want a combination therapy to be just toxic uh, per se. You want it to be toxic in a selective fashion in the sense that the combination should, should be more toxic in cancer cells, whereas its combination toxicity shouldn't be, um, uh, uh, shouldn't be compounding in normal cells. So you don't want a narrow therapeutic window, but instead you want the combination therapy to widen the therapeutic window to, to shift the dose response curve of cancer cells farther to the left um, than uh, that of the normal cells. So, so, for, so, so conceptually, for good combination therapies to work, they absolutely have to confer some sort of genotype specific synergy. And they need to widen the therapeutic window. And hopefully if they have orthogonal mechanisms of action, they could also delay the onset of drug induced uh, resistance. And this sort of leads to the search for additional targets. This is, some, this is a space where my lab um, has played an active role. So uh, in addition to directly target an oncogene and its signaling pathway, um, you can also explore other forms of vulnerabilities in cancer cells. And this is associated what, with what we call oncogenic stress. And, and to do so, we, we utilize a very classic concept of synthetic lethality in genetics, such that the idea is that because of genetic buffering in cancer cells, usually if you, um, there, there should exist genes whose loss of function is well tolerated in a normal setting. Because uh, say if you lose the function of gene B, but its activity is, can be buffered by the function of gene A, then the cell will be largely okay because gene A can now take over the function of gene B. However, when gene A is mutated, whether it's by a gain of function or loss of function mutation, you perturb this buffering power of the cell. Now the loss of gene B is no longer tolerated and the cells die and this is what we, we would call synthetic lethality. And this idea has been around for decades, but in the context of cancer, what we're looking for is that when you have a either oncogenic mutation such as those in KRAS or a tumor suppressor mutation such as those in T6 and T33, you change the fitness of the cells uh, through various forms of oncogenic stress. Now you have the, now you have the opportunity to disable one of those uh, pathways and now leads to genetic incompa incompatibility with the mutation and the demise of the cancer cell. Of course, in an ideal setting, because normal cells are wild type for the genes that are not mutated, then uh, the disruption of the function of the second gene is largely tolerated in normal cells. And so as I mentioned, tumor cells that harbor mutations in uh, the RAS gene, particularly KRAS, are continuously dependent on the function of KRAS because you, it, needs this con it needs constant signaling through these various signaling pathways to maintain this abnormal cell proliferation and survival response. And this is classically known as oncogene addiction that's coined by um, uh, Weinstein and colleagues. But what we also come to appreciate over the last uh, decade or so is that the cost of the malignant lifestyle is that tumor cells also experience a wide variety of oncogenic stress, such as metabolic alteration, DNA damage, genomic instability, increased reactive oxygen species, and so forth. And the tumor cells are also dependent on the continuous function of various cellular stress response pathways to repress this oncogenic stress to maintain their viability. And we call this no oncogene addiction to, to, to indicate that in fact these pathways, although they are themselves not mutated in cancer cells, have become more essential due to this unique aspects of oncogenic stress um, and they can be exploited. And, and tumor cells in fact are more vulnerable to their inhibition than normal cells. In fact, you can think of chemotherapy as a classic um, uh, effect of expressing, uh, exploiting oncogenic stress because of the increased DNA damage and decreased capacity to repair in cancer cells. So to summarize a lot of work from my lab and many other labs in the field, uh, there have been a number of synthetic lethal interactions that have been characterized uh, in, um, in, in the context of uh, uh, cancer cells with KRAS mutation that allows uh, one to exploit um, parallel survival signaling, alter transcriptional program, uh, alter genomic instability, as well as oncogene-induced uh, oncogene senescence, and all of which hopefully uh, could contribute to uh, the selective targeting of KRAS mutant cells in addition to targeting KRAS oncogenic signaling pathways. But one thing I wish to point out is that there isn't a universal golden bullet in the context of synthetic lethality that, that would select for KRAS 
selectively kill KRAS immune cells. And all of these synthetic lethal interaction occur in a tissue and genetic context dependent manner. And we believe that the best way to exploit this uh, uh, interaction is to uh, tar co-target them together with inhibitors that target KRAS oncogenic signaling pathways. And then towards this end, uh, we have initiated a project to really look at uh, the contribution of various forms of oncogene and no oncogene addiction, in other words, oncogenic signaling and synthetic lethality in KRAS tumor cells, in a hope to identify the most optimal drug target combinations. So instead of going uh, blindly to try um, one inhibitors in combination with uh, existing inhibitors such as chemotherapy, we really wanted to comprehensively ex uh, explore the target space to try to find the most promising target even before we go ahead and develop inhibitors or uh, try to put drugs together to test them in animals and, ho and, and hopefully ultimately in patients. So the question, the scientific question we're asking uh, behind this effort is uh, what are the critical oncoreceptors? In other words, RAS signaling, uh, 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 RAS signaling pathways that can distinguish the oncogenic and physiological activity of RAS signaling. And how are KRAS addiction communicated through its various components in the effective network? You've got to know which nodes are the most critical to target. And what are the critical stress response pathways that alleviate oncogenic stress in KRAS unit cells that we could leverage? And then through this knowledge, can we identify the ra a rational target combination downstream of mutant KRAS that does show properties of genotype selectivity and hopefully also orthogonal mechanisms of action. So to do this, uh, uh, we, uh, together with, in collaboration with uh, Scott Lowe and Frank McCormick's lab, uh, develop a, a sort of a, a technological trick where we can use uh, uh, RNAi and more recently CRISPR to, to co-target multiple genes in the same cell to ask the question, if we co-inhibit the function of several genes, which of these combinations can lead to the selective demise of KRAS in cell. And, we, and this is just to show you that we could knock down uh, the activity of seven genes simultaneously in the cell and, or in any all sorts of combination to ask this functional question. So uh, uh, using this platform, uh, Qi Sha Li, uh, a research fellow in my lab, um, have, 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 have basically looked at all the canonical RAS signaling pathways um, and a number of stress response pathways for their contribution to the KRAS oncogene addiction state. And the reason we developed this combinatorial approach is that in the human genome, each of these signaling nodes, in fact, represent multiple underlying gene paralogs that are, op that are often functionally redundant in their activity. So if you knock down the activity of one of these genes, which is what's being done traditionally, uh, you don't see, you cannot unmask the function of this node because the other gene paralogs can serve a redundant function. So, what, so to under, for example, to understand how the RAF kinase node contribute, contribute to RAS um, oncogene addiction, you've got to knock down some combination or even all of these different forms of RAF kinases in order to see its activity. So Chi Sha look at these 29 gene nodes shown here, um, which con he also look at, importantly, node pairs uh, in, in order to identify the best combinations. There are almost 400 node pairs um, together with 47 uh, so these constitute 47 genes and 20, 26 stress response points. Um, and then um, what he did was that he, he basically asked the question in KRAS mutant colorectal and pancreatic cancer cell line, as well as KRAS wild type cancer cell line, and ultimately untransformed normal epithelial cell lines. How does the knockdown of either individual gene nodes or pairs of gene nodes can selectively kill KRAS mutant cells? In fact, uh, so, 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 in other words, can it phenocopy the effect of eliminating the KRAS oncogene? And then uh, from there, uh, can, they, can we show that these combinations have reduced or, or, or no toxicity in either KRAS wild type cancer cells or in untransformed normal cells? And ultimately, can we parse down these various um, signaling nodes down to their bare minimum gene components in terms of nominating the minimum number of targets? Uh, for pharma, uh, pharmacological efforts. So the overall goal is really to identify optimal target combinations that can best capture the selectivity and toxicity of KRAS oncogene elimination. Because we know that if you hit the oncogene on its head, it's really, really selective and it's really potent. But since we can't do this, what are our next best options? 
So uh, this is a heat map of knocking down various components in the RAS signaling pathway uh, across KRAS green and KRAS wild type cells. And then we have developed a number of matrix to reduce this high dimensional data into a human interpreter number, uh, so-called differential dependency score between KRAS mutant and KRAS wild type cells, as well as the uh, particular gene nodes combination, uh, the, the correlation of a particular gene nodes behavior against uh, our positive control KRAS uh, knockdown. And uh, this scatter map shows you that in fact, the signaling nodes that's closest to the KRAS positive control is the RAS kinase node. In other words, the, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the, the RAS kinase node represents one particular signaling node that partition most of the KRAS oncogenic signaling. And of course, other RAS defector nodes also contribute. But what's also striking is that if you look at different cancer cell lines, all driven by the KRAS oncogene, they have fairly heterogeneous dependency on the various RAS signaling pathways. And this perhaps is not surprising at this point because we know that cancer is a heterogeneous disease and we don't really expect one particular pathway to dominate. And this explains also why inhibitors are targeting a single RAS defector of pathways haven't really shown a lot of um, activity uh, in patients. And then uh, next, we looked at various combination of RAS signaling nodes uh, for their ability to recapitulate KRAS addiction. In other words, they can kill KRAS mutant cells but not uh, spare KRAS wild type cells. And in fact, the cluster that best capture KRAS addiction are various combinations with the RAF kinase. So in other words, indeed the RAF kinase signaling node is the most critical in mediating RAS oncogenic signaling. And by layering a second target uh, group on top of it, you can improve this capture of KRAS dependency. And this is sort of uh, shown here in a, in, a, in a scatter map. All the red dots are various <coughs> combinations with RAF kinases that can get it closer now to the direct in elimination of KRAS. And this is again shows that this holds up in a, in a number of cancer cell lines. And again, this scattering is a natural property of various KRAS mutant cell lines ex exhibiting different degree of, uh, of utilization of these various oncogenic signaling and uh, no oncogene addiction pathways. And again, we see this heterogeneous patterns of pathway dependency that different cancer cell lines um, should different sensitivity to pairwise combination of gene nodes knockdown. And this is in fact predominantly driven by the primary uh, dependency in a particular cell line. And then what Shisha did was that he then parsed down the three most promising signaling nodes, RAF, RAL, and APG. Uh, this is the autophagy pathway to identify what are the, what are the mi minimum number of genes that he can knock down that could largely recapitulate KRAS dependency. And to cut a long story short, what he found is that by comparing the sensitivity of mutant KRAS versus KRAS uh, wild type cancer cells or versus KRAS wild type normal cells, the combination of RAF kinase, uh, RAF1, and also the E1 ligase in the autophagy pathway, HGG7, appears to be the most ideal combination. And pharmacologically, he could also show that in KRAS mutant cell lines, this is a colorectal cancer cell line, HC2116, and this is a pancreatic cancer cell line, Neopaka2, knocking down either RAC1 or HGG7 can sensitize uh, these cell lines towards either RAF kinase inhibitor or MEK kinase inhibitor both of which inhibit the MAP kinase pathway, and sometimes um, in, uh, reduce the IC50 by as much as one log. And phenotypically, what we saw is that when you, when you, when you, when you, when you target uh, RAC1 or ATG7 in combination with a MAP kinase pathway, you can either uh, increase cell cycle arrest or induce uh, apoptosis in KRAS mutant cells. And again, in KRAS wild type cells, um, uh, this combination doesn't really have this effect. Uh, these are the green cells. So this um, sort of satisfy our criteria of having a genotype specific combination that shows uh, KRAS mutant specific synergy. And so in summary, what we found is that by interrogating these various RAS signaling pathway as well as various stress response pathway, the RAF kinase, um, and the ATG autophagy pathway um, exemplified by, by the uh, E1 ligase ATG7 uh, represents a very strong um, combination that could 
best recapitulate K rest addiction. And also you get a contribution from the RAC1 GTTH node as well. And this is, this is nice because we have one target that comes from directly oncogenic KRAS signaling, and then we have the autophagy pathway, which we believe represents a form of a stress response rate that alleviate oncogenic stress as a result of inhibition of the mouse kinase pathway. And the model we're working with right now is that we think that in wild type cells, the autophagy pathway is dispensable. And when you, and, and, and physiological RAS signaling uh, can tolerate the loss of at least up to two components of the RAF kinase nodes, BRAF and CRAF. Whereas in the context of a KRAF mutant cells, a lot of oncogenic signaling is going through the RAF kinase node. And then when you take out BRAF and CRAF kinases, you strongly impair this oncogenic signaling effect of mutant KRAF. And also, if at the same time, you also disable the autophagy pathway by eliminating its E1 ligase, ATG7, you exacerbate oncogenic stress in this scenario, and this leads to genetic incompatibility and the death of KRAS mutant cells. So um, uh, gratifyingly, two other labs, one from uh, Martin McMahon's lab, and one, uh, uh, two studies, one from M Martin McMahon's lab and one from Channing Durr's lab, um, discovered the same combinations through independent approaches at about the same time that uh, we come upon our discovery. In fact, these three papers were published uh, within uh, a month or two of each other. So uh, what these labs found are in fact, again, uh, uh, pretty much uh, the same as what we have shown is that the combined targeting of the MAP kinase pathway, which represents oncogenic signaling downstream mutant KRAS, as well as the autophagy pathway, can show a very strong synergy um, in KRAS mutant cells. Whereas most of our work was done using a combinatorial genetic approach in cancer cell lines, uh, the McMahon and Durr studies uh, went into animal model as well as one patient where they show that in fact this uh, combination, so, so this yellow line is a combination of the MET kinase inhibitor trimendib uh, with uh, FDA approved uh, inhibitor called a chloroquine, which was originally used to treat malaria, but its function is to disrupt lysosome uh, activity and therefore indirectly interfere with the, the autophagy activity of the cell. You can see that this combination very potently inhibited tumor growth of the same MIA-PACA2 uh, uh, pancreatic cancer cell lines. And impressively, uh, the McMahon's lab had taken this approach uh, in, in the clinic and they treated one patient. This is a pancreatic, this is a terminal stage pancreatic cancer patient. Uh, you're just looking at the serum biomarkers for the tumor where the patient has pretty much exhausted all available standard of care chemotherapy as well as a number of uh, experimental therapies um, and uh, with no uh, response, but once they put this patient on the combination of MAP kinase inhibitor and hydroxychloroquine, in other words, co-targeting the MAP kinase pathway and the autophagy pathway, the patient had a very dramatic response, at least for the duration the patient was following. And this, together, these studies have led to a phase one trial now to formally test this combination of inhibiting the MAP kinase pathway and the autophagy pathway in patients with uh, pancreatic cancer, which is virtually 100% KRAS mutant, and going forward perhaps with other forms of KRAS mutant tumor. So uh, in conclusion, um, I, um, I've talked about the various strategies and challenges inhibiting uh, the function of mutant KRAS at, and its signaling pathway in order to uh, treat approximately 10% of epithelial tumors that have mutations in the RAS gene. Um, uh, I think going forward, uh, clearly, in order to effectively eliminate KRAS mutant cancer cells, it has to be a combination that involves perhaps some uh, form of KRAS, direct KRAS inhibitor and RAS onco, uh, onco, uh, oncogenic signaling pathway effector inhibitors, as well as synthetic lethal partners and stress response inhibitors. I don't have time to go into this, but clearly immunotherapy uh, spearheaded by um, Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Yang here um, have a would have an important role in this combination setting. And together, uh, the idea is that to find the optimal combination and exhibit the greatest selectivity and the greatest therapeutic window between KRAS immune cells and the normal proliferating tissues in the body in order to uh, effectively shrink this tumor and hopefully stem uh, the onset of drug uh, acquired drug resistance through the combination of orthogonal therapy. So with this, I'd like to close. Uh, by thanking various current and former members of my lab. Uh, the data I showed you about the 
a target combination uh, study was done by uh, my uh, uh, research fellow Chi Xia Li here. And of course, we had help from many, many collaborators that made our work possible. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, I used to work on the star kinase, and it's very close because I, I believe these the two are very traditional mm -hmm. oncogenes that relate to the yeah. cancer occurrence. And uh, so my first very basic question is that uh, I know the star has a cellular form and the viral form. Does it apply the same thing to RAS as well? Um, I know that they both discover in virus initially. Right. So so RAS has a so both K and H RAS were originally. Uh, discover as a viral form, right? VRAS, uh, the, the VKRAS and VHRAS. And, and it's through this sort of hybridization approach, it was realized that these viral oncogenes have human, uh, has origins in the human genome. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty much the exact analogous story to, to VSARC versus CSARC. Uh, so, so, except I think the difference is I think SARC isn't mutated in human cancer, but there are SARC inhibitors that are being tested in tumors where SARC activity is, is important. Whereas RAS, it's clear, it's a single point mutation that basically makes it constitutively active. Yeah, yeah I was about to ask a second question as like, whether there's a hotspot in the RAS gene, so. Right, so, so there's three hotspots that accounts for 90 plus percent of mutations in all three RAS genes are G12, G13, and Q61. And all of them basically disable the GTP hydrolysis activity of RAS to various extent, essentially making it a low, slow turnover enzyme that's stuck in the active state for most of the time and therefore uncouples RAS-stimulated mitogenic signaling from upstream regulation by receptor tyrosine kinases and other mitogenic receptors. Hi, um, I was wondering why did you decide to take that um, genetic based approach rather than using the inhibitors like the other groups did? Right, uh, so one of the reason is that if you look at the, at the space of available inhibitors, um, they, are very, um, they are very unevenly distributed across all possible drug targets in the human genome, in the so-called druggable parts of the genome. The majority of inhibitors, the target inhibitors, are focused on a few kinases. Um, and for many, many potential targets, including RAS itself, there are no pharmacological inhibitors. And then, of course, uh, the second complexity with small molecule inhibitors is that they tend to have off-target effects that are hard to anticipate. Because, for example, kinase inhibitors all look like ATP, and they would bind to the ATP binding pocket of your intended target, but they also have affinity for other kinases with a similar looking target. So for these two reasons, um, genetics, first of all, allow us to explore the available target space in an unbiased fashion. We could use genetics to, to downregulate or outright knock out any gene of interest to test whether it's a druggable target. Um, and second, uh, with genetics, um, I don't have time to show you this data. We could easily do rescue experiment to show that the genetic perturbation we introduce into the cell is an on-target effect due to the perturbation of the gene we intended to perturb rather than some other genes that are our sRNA or some other agents um, with, uh, that, uh, that have a potential for off-target effects. Whereas with small molecules, that's actually more difficult because you had to introduce a drug-resistant mutant, which is not always available in order to uh, conclusively show that your inhibitor is in fact perturbing your target, your intended target, but not other targets. And in fact, this is one of the issues with a lot of inhibitor studies where it's really unclear when you have a simple assay as to you know, cell death, what the inhibitor is doing, whether it's engaging its primary target or it's through its off-target effect. That's a really cool approach, thank you. You're welcome. Do you mind if I ask, sorry, just one sure. more question at yeah. that time? Um, I wanted to know, um, so you alluded to the mutation in RAS um, changing its conformational 3D structure. Mm -hmm. Has anyone tried to design any inhibitors against that new 3D structure? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, uh, in fact, that's an that's a intense 
uh, intensely active area for over two decades. Uh, but uh, the, the, the problem with RAS is that you know, some, some scientists in the field would uh, unofficially refer to it as a Teflon protein because it's a small protein that was a relatively smooth surface. It doesn't have a lot of pockets for small molecules to gain purchase on. Um, the only deep pocket is the GTP binding pocket, but the GTP binds so tightly that it's almost impossible to compete with GTP binding using another inhibitor. So, so there, there are still ongoing efforts to try to get drugs to stick to various small pockets on RAS protein and then use clever approaches through fragmented, uh, uh, fragment uh, based drug discovery to try to link them up to gain avidity to eventually have sufficient affinity for RAS. Uh, but that's a very active area of research. It's just that it's been sort of um, biochemically and pharmacologically, it's just a very, very tough nut to crack as a target itself. That's why so much effort has been, including ours, have been focused on uh, looking for uh, a, a combination that targets drug that we can inhibit downstream of RAS. But the NCI RAS initiative, that's their singular focus, is to develop direct inhibitors for RAS proteins using some of these new chemistry and biophysical approaches. Thank you, Jay. Great. And our next speaker is Neil Caparosa. He was an undergraduate at Rutgers, then he got his MD from the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey. He did an internal medicine residency, and then he came to NIH initially as an oncology fellow in the medicine branch, and then he became a biotechnology fellow in the experimental epidemiology branch, became chief of the pharmacogenetics section of the DCEG, genetic epidemiology branch, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about epidemiology. What a surprise. Thank you. <laughs> Usually takes me a few minutes to figure out how the slides work. Ah, yes. Okay, forwards, backwards. Okay. Um, I have a fair number. Some would say an excessive number of slides. The record's oh, 160. 160? Oh, I'm well under that. But um, uh, I divide them into three groups. One are factual information. Uh, the other are concepts, and the third is controversy. I'm really going to spend a little more time on the controversy. The facts, you can Google. You know, I'll tell you when we get to a run of facts, and you know, we're going to go through those pretty quick. Um, and the concepts I'll talk about a little bit. So uh, yeah, I'm an internist, oncologist. Uh, I have some background in epidemiology, in meteorology, uh, and environmental science. So I have a checkered history to get here. So uh, what is epidemiology? Well, the fundamental thing about epidemiology is population science. It's not clinical. It's not laboratory. Um, so we talk in epidemiology, you're talking about um, the population. And we kind of take a lot of what we know uh, for granted about um, what cancer risk factors are and what they're not. But um, a lot of it, a lot of our general knowledge kind of comes from society and a lot of that is wrong. Um, and just, you know, some decades ago, uh, cigarettes were, you know, considered not really harmful. Um, and trusted figures in the culture were used to uh, kind of portray the idea that they really weren't bad. And if they were bad, uh, certainly some kinds of cigarettes weren't as bad as others. So doctors were used to sell cigarettes. Um, today, uh, there's lots of things in the environment that may be almost as bad, um, but they haven't really been the target of study. Uh, but I believe that, you know, as we get around to studying some of these areas, we may find that um, actually they are quite harmful. So sugar is one example, and there are others. So 
Um, epidemiology is concerned with human populations and it's an observational science like astronomy or evolutionary biology and you contrast that with an experimental science. Uh, you don't get to pick who is exposed and who is unexposed, so you have to observe. Free living people make choices about um, what they do and so uh, there's a whole set of rules and laws for how um, we draw inferences in epidemiology. Um, just to mention uh, in NCI, uh, the division that uh, focuses on epidemiology is uh, the DCEG, Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. And uh, there are nine uh, branches in that group and I'm in the Occupation and Environmental Epidemiology branch. Uh, it's an intramural branch. Uh, that's about 15% of NCI. 85% is devoted to uh, the extramural activities, grants and such. Um, the other branches involve uh, metabolic group, which is nutrition and hormones, a group of focusing on infection, two genetics groups, statistics and radiation. So um, I won't go into any detail about this, but DCEG has been responsible for a lot of public health advances, uh, focusing on every area is as diverse as drinking water, uh, studies of benzene, many, many studies of workplace safety, most recently studies of diesel, uh, many studies of farming, uh, pesticides, cancer susceptibility studies, uh, second malignancy, uh, studies of radiation and safer CT scans, uh, risk-reducing surgeries and genetic syndromes, um, studies of obesity, uh, and HPV and cervical cancer. Um, so the goals in DCEG identify the genetic and environmental causes of cancer in the environment and uh, the usual blah, 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 conduct high impact high uh, uh, quality research. So there are a lot of collaborations around the world. We have studies in China, all over Europe, pretty much uh, every country. And you can find a lot um, on the web if you search for us. And there are risk assessment tools um, uh, uh, on, the, on the web that you can find. So a little bit more about observational versus experimental studies. Um, we're ethically prohibited from doing studies um, uh, on people that assign exposures. So we can't randomize people to uh, be smokers. So that limits what we can do. And that was a design weakness that um, was a flaw that tobacco companies used. So when the first uh, case control studies emerged in the 40s, the late 40s and the, mainly the 1950s, tobacco companies attacked them saying, wow, these studies really aren't methodologically sound. Um, um, so a really a lot of the um, uh, science of epidemiology evolved to address these kinds of concerns. So this is actually an important slide. I don't wanna spend a minute here because you're gonna hear this critique a lot um, about the kinds of studies we should do to prove things in epidemiology. So people will say what we need is a randomized clinical trial. And in fact, you could imagine this is kind of a pyramid. Where do ideas come from about what causes cancer or disease? And in fact, they come from uh, anecdotes about individual patients and observations of astute clinicians. And then studies are done in small unrepresentative samples. Uh, and then we do cross-sectional studies. Then we do case control studies. Then we do cohort studies, and finally, for the very uh, best hypotheses, we take them to randomized clinical trials. Why do we do them in this order? It's simply a matter of cost, okay? It costs nothing to do these kinds of studies, and you can go to NHANES and other databases, and for relatively minor costs, um, you know, $1,000, you can assemble a database and conduct a study. To do a case control study can cost tens of thousands of dollars. I personally have done a um, case control study that cost $5 million. So it can cost a lot. 
cohort studies virtually always cost in the millions and uh, randomized clinical trials can cost hundreds of thousands to close to a billion dollars. So PLCO um, probably cost a third of a billion dollars. So if you hear someone saying, we should always do randomized clinical trials. Great idea if you have the money and you have to allocate your resources wisely. So the goals of epidemiology identify the causes, quantify risks. Um, epidemiologists generally uh, divide their attention between science and ethics. We want to do good for public health. Okay, so there's kind of uh, both goals there. Uh, we want to identify syndromes, trends, epidemics. Uh, a more recent goal as we become more biologic is to identify mechanisms and of course prevention. Okay, why prevention? Well, um, prevention heads off disease at an early stage. It's effective, it's cheap, it's uh, public health orientation. You eliminate disease at the source. Um, it requires education and communication. There are problems with prevention. The big problem is that it requires a lot of time to demonstrate its effectiveness. It's less dramatic than treatment. Um, it doesn't play as well to funding agencies and Congress. It's much more effective to have cured patients uh, that are grateful and you know, say, I'm cured, this is wonderful. Um, so it's not as politically impactful. Um, also, you get political opposition from powerful groups when you try to limit exposures. So tobacco companies, soft drink companies, polluters, all uh, are powerful, uh, powerfully oppose uh, efforts to do prevention. Also, you don't get a Nobel Prize for doing prevention. So it um, can be argued that the scientists that first identified smoking as a risk factor probably saved a billion lives. Um, and maybe there's a billion more that will be saved. Did they get a Nobel Prize? No, they, got, they were vilified at the time. And um, you know, so it's tough. OK, epidemiologists also worry a lot about bias. Um, and there are all sorts of bias. Um, you can look these up. I won't go into them, but uh, key uh, types of bias, uh, you worry that when you study cases and controls that the subjects you study are not representative of your target populations and therefore your results are not generalizable to the uh, population. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, that large case control study I told you about uh, was a study of lung cancer and when we proposed the study, they said, great, if you want to spend $5 million to do a case control study, we want you to have a high participation rate so that your subjects are representative. If you can't do that, we will not let you do the study. So we did a series of pilots. The first pilot we did, we called up people in the general population and said, hey, how'd you like to be in a study? We'll give you a questionnaire. We're going to take some blood. Um, 30% of the people said they'd do it. We then said, okay, uh, we sent them an invitation letter. We followed it up with a phone call. We said we'd study people either at home or in the hospital. We put ads, we gave them cash. We sent a letter from their physician. We got it up to 49%, not good enough. We still couldn't do the study. Then we got extremely charming interviewers of the opposite sex. We um, got their physician to call. We gave them gas coupons, which were extremely valuable in Italy, more valuable than money. Um, we had TV ads instead of media. Um, we got a letter from the mayor. The mayor happened to be popular. This got us over 70%. We were allowed to do the study. Epidemiologists are fraught with concern about controls. Um, and there are all sorts of controls. The bad controls are convenience controls. Okay, we're going to study everyone in our lab. Those would be the controls. You know, um, that's not good. Okay, you want uh, controls that are comparable in terms of their risk factors, ethnicity, education, age, 
access to care, socioeconomic status, et cetera. The ideal kind of control is a population control, someone selected at random from the population from which your cases arise. These are expensive, um, and, uh, but they allow you to do things like calculating absolute risk, uh, which is really a good thing to be able to calculate instead of relative risk. I actually had a new set of slides where I showed you some contrast between absolute risks and relative risks. I'll talk about this a little later. Um, Anyway, it's getting increasingly hard to get population controls. The gold standard for doing this is random digit dialing, RDD. But today, in today's environment, if you call up people at random, basically everyone hangs up. So it's really a challenge to get um, random controls. And in our large population cohorts, um, the uh, uh, unfortunately, the response rate tends to be only three to five percent. So we're not getting a highly representative sample. Um, that's just the way it is today. Okay, if you um, get a consultant, uh, an epidemiologist consultant, they're going to ask you about your study design, where your controls came from. Did you collect covariates so you can adjust your data? Did you consider bias and confounding? Uh, what's your original hypothesis? Did you write it down so that you don't do data dredging later on and generate multiple hypotheses that distort your statistics? Did you do power calculations? Did you validate your biomarkers? And the most common question we get is, oh, I have a grandmother who smoked her whole life. She never did exercise. She ate bacon and donuts. She lived to be 90. Why is that? And of course, the answer is that it's a probabilistic scientist. It's not deterministic. OK, so um, there are outliers. In fact, it's mathematically inevitable that there will be outliers. OK, so a few tools that epidemiologists use. Um, we make cancer maps. And this is one that was made about 15 years ago. And uh, you can make them using SEER. SEER is surveillance epidemiology and end results. It involves 26% of the US population, 11 states. Um, and there's a lot of resources for SEER online. I'll let you find them. Um, here's a graph that we did this week. And this shows US counties. The reason I made this graph is to look at uh, cancer rates in counties in relation to time zone, because we have a hypothesis that um, your position in time zone is related to uh, certain hormone-related cancers because of circadian disruption. So we were looking for a trend, which um, is a little bit hard to see. Anyway, we use NACER data, which is a consortium of cancer registries, and um, it's four times larger than SEER. So there's a lot of great resources out there um, to make these kinds of maps and um, uh, use these resources. So just to show you, oh, and another, um, there's a emerging area, uh, very exciting in the last few years, using geographic information systems, using satellite data to get all sorts of cool information about um, environmental factors uh, from satellites. I won't go into that. But here's an example of the kinds of data you can get from SEER. Um, looking at cancer incidence, here's time, and here's cancer incidence. And you see, oh, look, something has happened with men. Cancer incidence has gone up. Does anyone know what caused this bump back in the early 1990s? So here it is in white men and African American men, and women are flat. And uh, the answer is, uh, it was prostate cancer, and it was due to the fact that PSA screening was introduced, and a lot of uh, early cases of prostate cancer were diagnosed. So it's a kind of uh, surveillance bias. Um, here's an uh, interesting finding that the incidence rate and the mortality rate in pediatric cancer are quite different. And what does that indicate? It shows you that treatment is effective that uh, our treatments for pediatric cancer, many kinds of pediatric cancer, do a decent job. 
a feature that epidemiologists are very concerned with is causation. And um, uh, there are a lot of ways that epidemiologists address causation. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Bradford Hill criteria, but um, a, a very exciting area is mediation analysis. Uh, there's an a, a approach using genetics to infer causality called Mendelian randomization. And molecular epidemiology uses biomarkers. But this particular book, um, the book of why I recommend to anyone that uh, is interested in this area, it describes uh, some of the mathematics of mediation analysis. And um, it's a very exciting and cool uh, approach. And I think it will have lots of applications, for instance, in climate. Um, you want to know to what extent um, is our hurricanes, uh, the strength of hurricanes related to climate change. And you can uh, use model-based approaches to um, draw inference about that. Um, but uh, the more historic and basic uh, kinds of approaches by Bradford Hill say that we can prove a cause in epidemiology by um, a number of characteristics. And the most basic of them are, uh, we tend to believe a cause if it is associated with a high relative risk, if it's consistent, if it's uh, present in a number of different studies, if there's a dose response, we have more of the cause if there's more of the outcome. If the cause occurs first temporally, we like causes to occur before outcomes. And if the biology makes sense, if there's um, mechanistic uh, uh, kind of story behind it. So which of the following is more convincing? Lung cancer associated with cigarette smoking, odds ratio of 20, or colon cancer is associated with red meat consumption, odds ratio of 1.2. And I think that's obvious. Low risks um, tend to be called into question. Uh, first, the risk is not clinically significant, and I didn't go into it, but relative risks, uh, low relative risks are associated with very non-significant absolute risks. So a odds ratio of 1.2 is an extremely not significant uh, absolute risk. Um, residual confounding um, tends to distort low uh, odds ratios. So what could distort red meat? Well, anything that's associated with it, uh, like smoking and other shared risks. And there's a long list of them here. Um, meat eaters tend to have other unhealthy features. They drink more alcohol, they exercise less, uh, they are uh, more often sedentary, they're poor, less educated, et cetera. There are also dietary associations with red meat. They consume more sugar, processed fat, french fries, et cetera. And I showed the, the previous slide last year. This year, just uh, about two weeks ago, a series of papers came out in Annals of Internal Medicine summarizing the literature on red meat and saying there was little evidence for adverse cancer or cardiovascular outcomes associated with meat consumption. So um, it was good to have some skepticism about uh, these kinds of findings. And in general, uh, I would say it's good to have a lot of skepticism about isolated dietary findings. So when you read that yogurt has been associated with, uh, you know, I would be very, very cautious about that kind of study. So here's just some examples of the lung cancer to show you a true association. So here are three different cohort studies and notice the consistency, notice the dose response. So this is the odds ratio and this is cigarette smoke per day and there's a beautiful consistency between these three cohort studies and risk of lung cancer. Here's the temporal sequence. So we have male smoking and female smoking. And as you're probably aware, women began smoking later uh, than men, it was socially acceptable. Um, and the rate as male smoking increased, male lung cancer increased, and as female smoking increased, female lung cancer rates rose. 
And this was a study, a famous study in New England Journal uh, where they attached eagles to uh, smoking machines and then showed the histologic changes and paralleled exactly the histologic changes uh, in humans as they uh, went from dysplasia, metaplasia uh, to early in situ carcinoma to lung cancer. So this was good mechanistic evidence uh, implicating um, tobacco smoke in lung cancer development. And finally, a nice uh, study, again, in three different cohorts, where they had people quitting smoking, and then they showed that as the years uh, passed quitting smoking, the rate of lung cancer dropped consistently. So this was highly compelling evidence also. OK, so what kinds of things have epidemiologists accomplished? And um, I can only touch on a few examples. Um, general and specific causes of cancer, um, advocates of public health. Uh, we've talked about tobacco. I'm going to mention a little bit about secondary tobacco smoke, because it's something that affects all of our lives. Uh, and I'll touch on molecular epidemiology. So uh, DCEG has been involved over the years in a lot of uh, different areas, from silicone breast implants to Chernobyl. There's a whole unit that follows up uh, Chernobyl um, and a lot of these other areas. Um, one of the conclusions that's pretty solid from the body of epidemiologic research is that most cancer is due to the environment. Um, and that is because the dramatic differences in cancer rates over time and over geography are only compatible with extrinsic environmental causes. And here's a slide that summarizes some of this data. And what this shows is for a variety of kinds of cancer, uh, the country where the rates are the highest, the country where the rates are the lowest. So these differences are not like 1.2 or 1.7. The differences are a hundredfold in some cases. Now, um, for some cancers, the differences are not so great, but they're still uh, quite substantial. Um, uh, so, melanoma um, and lung cancers that are probably best established as having extrinsic environmental carcinogens, the differences are great. Um, and for some other, others, they're less. But for all of them, they're substantial. Cancer maps. So here's an example of a copper smelter that uh, caused a lung cancer hotspot in a particular area in Montana. This was removed, and the hotspot went away. And here's Zhenhui province in China. We have a study here, um, particular focused on the indoor ovens. So people there, their practice was to have indoor ovens and that were not vented. So the um, pollution indoors was spectacularly high. And uh, when they introduced indoor venting, these rates uh, improved tremendously. Um, and of course, um, you know, studies have been done showing that you can have substantial reduction in cancers by um, identifying and eliminating certain um, cancer risk factors, particularly, for example, uh, HPV is a great example. But the two biggest risk factors, smoking and alcohol, um, you know, could make substantial impacts. It's a little tougher to deal with in family history. Uh, a word about tobacco, because it's still the number one um, preventable cause of morbidity and mortality and responsible for one in five uh, U.S. Uh, cancer deaths, actually overall deaths. Um, the number of deaths uh, worldwide continue to increase, which is uh, hard to believe, but it's uh, true. Um, it's related to cancers at eight sites, all of which are difficult to treat. Um, the uh, tobacco-related disease costs are spectacularly high, uh, over $10 billion a year. Um, 
And uh, you know, so there's still a lot of work to do with tobacco. Uh, and we're doing it um, since the Surgeon General's report in, over a half a, a century ago, rates of smoking have gone down. Uh, this is not the case in the developed world. Um, so hundreds of millions of deaths will continue to occur due to tobacco. Um, we can be thankful, though, that uh, studies of environmental tobacco smoke showed consistent risk. And this was pushed by special interest groups. Who were the special interest groups? Airline uh, stewardesses and pilots uh, funded and pushed studies. And those studies um, uh, showed that um, spouses of smokers were at higher risk. Um, and that in turn eventually led to um, the consensus that environmental tobacco smoke was a class of human uh, carcinogen, meta-analyses all agreed, and that led to clean air legislation, which is why we can go into restaurants, movie theaters, workplaces, and not have to breathe other people's smoke. So I think um, that's something we can be thankful for. Uh, we've done studies of light and intermittent smoking, and this is an area of smoking that's actually rising, particularly in selected um, ethnic groups, uh, and in national surveys, um, substantial numbers of people intermittently smoke. And so um, this is kind of a scary thing. And a question has arisen, is this associated with any danger? I mean, maybe if you just smoke on weekends or you know, when you go to a bar, it's OK. Uh, no, not the case. So all cause mortality um, increases substantially uh, as, you, um, as you smoke, even intermittently. OK, I'm not going to go into uh, alcohol, uh, coffee. Coffee, by the way, is not a risk factor. Coffee is a protective factor. Um, ionizing radiation, Chernobyl, uh, I'm going to infections. Just to say that these are all areas of very active study, occupational carcinogens. I will mention that fielding studies of occupational and environmental carcinogens is a very difficult thing because there's opposition. So manufacturing groups attack you and you get brought before Congress and you have to testify and they use FOIA's Freedom of Information Act to demand all your data, and they hire industry shills to reanalyze your data and try and find the least little flaw. And so it's a rather um, you know, difficult thing. But we do it. Um, we'll continue to do it. And um, uh, you may not realize it, but there's a lot of political opposition to studying occupational carcinogens, pesticides, and those studies are done against a continual wave of um, outside opposition. OK, so what can go wrong? So here is the opinion and um, perspective for having been in this area for 30 years. I want to give you a little flavor of some of the things that go wrong. OK, problem with exposures is that, as I told you, the um, uh, I'm going to try and finish in 20 minutes to leave room for some questions. Um, that for many cancers, we have no clue what are the extrinsic environmental causes. OK, brain, sarcomas, pediatric, lung and non-smokers, up to a quarter of lung cancer is, occurs in non-smokers. What's going on? Of course, some of them are asbestos, radon, um, um, heavy metals. But a substantial number, we have no clue what's going on. That All that international variation I showed you, we can explain maybe half of it. The rest is very unknown. Um, early life exposures are a big gap. We don't know um, what really is going on. We know that. There are vulnerabilities at certain times of life. For example, 
uh, smoking for young women at Menarche likely is a breast cancer risk factor, but not uh, later on. Many exposures are difficult to assess, and it's kind of like round up the usual suspects, but don't bother me to ask questions in areas that are difficult. So people have started to ask about sleep, but they don't ask about chronotype. You know what chronotype is, um, whether your tendency is to be an early or a late riser. Um, they don't ask much about quality of sleep, which is super important. So it's well established that sleeping less than six hours or more than 10 hours is bad, but that's probably because there's other sleep pathology going on there. Um, uh, things like snoring or uh, sleep apnea. Um, and so you need to ask about those kinds of things. Um, Activity levels, it's really difficult to ask about activity, and it's even more difficult to ask about inactivity, which is a separate and independent risk factor. Diet is notoriously difficult. No one asks about circadian disruption. We think that's quite critical. Light, very important. Uh, there are all sorts of diverse and new pollutants in the environment. Uh, climate change has pretty much been ignored as a um, area that's too hot to study. Here's an example of a malignancy. Uh, the most common adult leukemia in the Western world, we have uh, no idea what the extrinsic environmental cause is. Family history and age, that's it. Okay, I'll just say a word about genetics. Um, genes associated with all the common cancers confer some risk. We've known this since, well, We've known it for a few decades based on epidemiologic studies and GWAS studies since 2007. Um, but we know very little about how gene and environment work together. You'll hear a lot about gene environment studies, but in fact, the studies tend to be pathetically underpowered and there are like literally two or three gene environment interactions that are well established in cancer, the rest are you know, not been studied with sufficient power to establish anything. That said, all cancer seems to be associated with some genetic alterations. But when we talk about genetics, you have to be careful. Are we talking about germline or somatic? And I'm talking about somatic when I say all cancer. Um, family studies are used to study rare uh, mutations that dictate certain cancers. Population studies for looking at the common uh, genetics alterations. And um, candidate versus agnostic. Agnostic is, of course, um, what we look for in GWAS studies. So to look for rare genes, you need families. And we have a lot of families like this where we have um, particular families where certain leukemias, for example, segregate. And a lot of uh, familial tumor suppressor genes have been cloned out of uh, subjects in these kinds of families. And this just GWAS, this is an older slide when we had 240 disease loci. Now there's over 1,000. But a surprising number of these we really don't know. So there's a SNP that is associated, but we really don't know what the underlying gene is. OK, so I said we did a large case control study of lung cancer with 2,000 cases and 2,000 controls. We did this over 10 years ago. Why did we do it? Um, lung cancer is still number one in terms of mortality. Uh, they said to us, hey, we know tobacco is the big risk factor. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to spend $5 million? And we said, look, to both treatment and screening don't work. Um, we need to understand the genetics better. Uh, we need to understand how genes and environment work together. We need to understand more about the risk factors. Uh, the study was called EGLE, and um, we wanted to go after behavioral factors. We wanted to get uh, biologically intensive. In other words, we collected a ton of blood on all these people and tried to um, put liquid nitrogen in every operating room and collect tissue. Um, first thing we showed was that, yes, family history is a risk factor. So you have a relative with lung cancer, after taking into account all other risk factors, your odds ratio for lung cancer is greater if it was genetic. Um, 
Traditional epidemiology looks at an exposure and disease and uses statistics to infer a relationship. But we wanted to do molecular epidemiology where you use biomarkers and you look at genes and you look at different uh, factors on the causal pathway. And we added a thing called integrative epidemiology where we look at the behaviors that are related to the exposures. So for instance, if you have a tendency for addiction, how does that alter your smoking? And okay, you have lung cancer, but how does that affect your survival? How do the genes, for example, affect whether you live or die or respond to the treatment? So those are things we built in. And so we got tissue. We included detailed dietary associations, including doneness. And we included all sorts of questionnaires to assess things like depression, anxiety, addiction, um, uh, ADHD, uh, whether they felt like they wanted to quit, whether they were able to quit, and of course, treatment, survival, prognosis. Uh, I don't have time to go into the accomplishments of molecular epidemiology in general. Let me just say this study has published well over 100 um, different papers in all these different areas. Um, one of the things that this study does and that all of these studies do now is we belong to consortia. So our lung cancer study, basically we contribute to three different lung consortia um, because no study has sufficient power to study, for instance, 2000 lung cancer cases, we only have 150 non-smokers. So we get together with all the other consortia and we pull out all the non-smokers to try and investigate what's really going on with non-smokers. And we also contribute to questionnaire consortia so that if anyone is starting a new study, they can benefit from the experience of everybody else and pull in the best questionnaires to characterize exposure. Okay, so those are some challenges. What other kinds of things can go wrong? Um, in science, paradigm change is hard. Things, uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote um, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and what he said was that, in a nutshell, that things don't change. Basically, the old scientists have to die off. Is the only way anything changes. And I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Actually, we change a lot, but um, you could make the argument that uh, people become entrenched with what they believe and it's really hard to change them. So here's an example. Um, here are obesity rates from 1990 to 2015. And this is a staggering change. In 1990, and by the way, you can go online and see the maps for every year on the CDC website. No state had greater than 20% obesity Today, no state is under 20%. It's literally hard to believe. If you want an interesting exercise, go to your parents' college or high school yearbook and leaf through it and look at the pictures of people. And they look like stick figures. They're so thin. Okay, is there something wrong with them? Were they not feeding people? You know, what, what, was, it, what was the matter? Okay, so following obesity, diabetes has similarly accelerated. Here's diabetes prevalence in 2012, and since then it's continued to rise. So 15% of the population is adult is diabetes. Who knows what percentage is diabetic or pre-diabetic? Greater than 50% pre-diabetic or diabetic. Greater than 50%. Is it only the United States? No. Virtually every country is following a similar trend. I don't know of any country that's not. So here's worldwide. And do we care about cancer? Yeah. There's at least 13 cancers that are related and 200 other conditions. Why? So I was at a meeting at Cleveland Clinic last week um, where 
they had, you know, the, you know, the first lecture is always, okay, why is there an obesity epidemic? They don't really know. Um, so there's always a list of contributing factors, changes in diet, macronutrients, quality of food, processed food, fast food, obesogens in the environment, um, changes in activity, we're more inactive, we're less active, we're looking at our phones all the time, um, the soil is depleted of key nutrients. Uh, we're circadian disrupted. Um, too much light at night, not enough light uh, during the day. All of these are, you know, long list, but no, but none of these are actually, when you examine each one closely, is a great explanation. Um, if you look at history, uh, one clue is that way back, and uh, this is Ansel Keys and the dietary heart hypothesis, uh, back in the 70s when Eisenhower got his heart attack and everyone panicked. And at the time, um, no one said, hey, you're a two pack per day smoker. No, what they said is you're having a sausage for breakfast and um, we really need to cut the fat. And at the time, Ansel Keys had been to Italy after World War II and Everyone was eating pasta and no one was fat. And they didn't have many heart attacks. And he said, I think, I think we need low fat. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But um, the McGovern Commission uh, proposed less fat and um, as a dietary change. And of course, if you take the fat out of food, what goes in? Sugar and carbohydrates. And uh, you don't have meat and milk and dairy, and so you have to put in processed vegetable oils. And um, you had the food pyramid from the USDA. By the way, this week, the USDA is considering revisions to their recommendations. This week, um, I'm not sure there's gonna, they're going to make any. Um, and uh, I, you know, the American Heart Association puts their heart healthy logo on foods that contain oats and other margarine things that supposedly lower cholesterol, but are loaded with sugar. Because of these dietary changes, um, over the decades, the carb consumption has gone up, fat consumption has gone down, Saturated fat has gone down. We do consume less milk, eggs, but um, that really wasn't, didn't do much good. And the standard American diet um, uh, is identical to obesogenic rat fat, rat chow. In other words, protein's low, fat's moderate, carbohydrate's moderate, essentially like a donut. Um, okay, well, uh, and um, the Eat Lancet Commission, you may be familiar with this. This has gotten a lot of publicity, and if you read Lancet, you're going to see studies about this. But basically, they're promoting a plant-based um, diet, and this is Walt Willett, who's the most famous nutritional epidemiologist in the country from Harvard. Um, he's a good guy, but... Um, he is vegetarian. Anyway, uh, and you know, there's certainly some positive features to this diet, but I feel there's a lot of danger in promoting a diet that lacks a scientific background. And we made dietary changes in the United States many decades ago that were not science based, you know, based on a commission, the McGovern Commission that. You know, they admitted at the time, they said, well, we, we really don't have any science to support this, but we got to do something because. Um, so there's a lot of debate in nutritional epidemiology and the leading uh, John Ioannidis um, has criticized um, nutritional epidemiology a lot. And the Harvard epidemiologists have argued against them. Uh, Giovannucci is a good guy. You know, so there's a debate you can read about this. But uh, I really think we need a lot of reform in nutritional epidemiology 
because the, it's, it's a catastrophic situation, the obesity epidemic and the, um, uh, the, the diabetes epidemic that follows it. I showed you the figure saying that, you know, the cost to Medicare, Medicaid uh, of the tobacco epidemic is 10 to 20 billion a year. Um, the cost of the obesity and diabetes epidemic is at least 10 times as much. It's a third of a trillion worldwide. And it's literally an unsustainable cost. So I think, you know, a lot more needs to be done. So here's an example of the meat studies that, um, you know, so meat was associated with uh, uh, colon cancer. And, you know, meat, unfortunately, this is what you imagine when they, you think of meat, but in fact, the reality of the way meat is consumed, it's consumed with a lot of other factors. So uh, the questionnaires that were used to assess meat are highly limited and they don't capture all this other stuff that goes with the meat. So there are a lot of methodologic limitations here. Um, and I said I would stop a few minutes before, so I'm going to rapidly go to the last section on prevention. Um, okay, and oh, one last slide in this section, randomized clinical trials and low fat. I said there was no scientific basis, so there have been a lot of meta-analyses of low fat. And I remember when head of the nutritional branch um, uh, did the polyp prevention trial. And he had a study, except in a New England journal, where they spent an enormous amount of money randomizing people to a low fat diet. Where they had dietitians every week. You know, they, they had the whole grains and low fat margarine. And, you know, for years they ate this diet and then they calculated the number of polyps. And the results, you know, the curve was identical. There was no benefit whatsoever from the low fat. And pretty much every other study, oh, there were some tiny, tiny, one study showed a tiny difference for one cardiovascular endpoint. Anyway, um, you know, the studies were nothing and they spent millions on this. So, okay. So I'm gonna skip over the rest of the obesity business. Uh, I personally, uh, my studies are of insulin, and um, I think insulin's probably uh, the bad actor. Okay, where should epidemiology go? I'm gonna do this in two minutes and then give you five minutes questions. We need to go after inaccessible exposures. We need more extensive data. We need to reduce misclassification. We need to validate data. We need better risk models. Um, traditional lung cancer risk factors are what we usually collect, but we need to go after, we need to use technology to go after factors we haven't gone after in the past. And so technology can capture sleep. Um, and we've done this in NHANES. Uh, you can capture activity and inactivity with actigraphy. You can capture va uh, vital signs. You can capture activity and do a nice graph of circadian variation, capture uh, chronotypes. Important to capture social data. You can capture pulse ox, really important. One cohort study did this and showed it's a risk factor. And I believe to do risk models, uh, you need traditional epi data, but you also need genetics, biomarkers, and technology. And that's how you're gonna get risk models that'll really work. Um, so I'll stop there and any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering about um, the new now ways of uh, smoking, the vapes and uh, um, the e-cigarettes. The e um, is there like any uh, studies you guys have done or doing for that? So I'm sorry, which studies? Um, the e vaping. vaping and e-cigarettes. Okay, so um, 
two areas have been identified as big priorities for future studies for NCI. One is cannabis and the other is vaping. And um, NCI has been a little bit reticent to get into both of those areas. Why is that? Um, the, the main reason is that we study or are most interested in cancer. And cancer is a tough endpoint for vaping because the um, whatever vaping is doing, cancer is not the most likely outcome. It's likely a long-term outcome. So what we need to do is capture vaping in our cohorts, but our cohorts for economic reasons are focused on the age groups that get cancer. Okay, we don't got many 20 year olds in our cohorts. Why is that? Because you have to wait five decades for them to get cancer. And the people that start the cohorts would like to be alive when they can you know, get enough power, accumulate enough cancer endpoints. So for reasons like this, NCI has not been the lead institute to do these studies. Um, so you've seen this, you know, epidemic now of um, infectious um, or toxic uh, diseases coming out of vaping, and it, NCI is not leading it because um, it's not our, you know, it's not our endpoints. It's obviously extremely important and critical. And the controversy is, hey, are we is the diseases, these short-term diseases, are we getting some benefit in that these people are actually quitting smoking or, or is the vaping actually a, a step and these people are gonna you know, move on to you know, tobacco smoking down the road? So. What about microbiota changes and obesity? So, Changes in the microbiome associated with obesity are one of the most um, consistent findings in animals. So you do get changes in bacteroides and other species and some of the ratios. Um, and that has not been well studied. And in fact, um, you know, there's been a lot of work in our group, not my group, but you know, other DCEG groups to validate uh, microbiome studies so that you can do them in a reproducible and large scale manner in large populations. So we kind of passed through the, let's just do a few people and see what we see stage to let's do this in a way that it can be reproducible in a large cohort study and sufficiently powered so we have hundreds to thousands of people and follow them over time to see which microbiome changes are really associated with disease. So I think the obesity features are very important, but one of the things you'd like to see is, oh, when people lose weight, do they actually change their microbiome? Unfortunately, in cohorts, um, you're probably aware that there are no great interventions that make people sustain a weight loss over time. The three major interventions are surgery, which to some extent does work, um, medications, which partially work, and lifestyle change, which unfortunately doesn't work so well. Um, so we don't have large uh, studies where you know, we've, we've seen what happens to the microbiome. I think you'll start to see that over the next few years though. But it's difficult to power those studies again because you take a hundred people and you put them on a diet and, you know, maybe a year later, only a small number will have really sustained the weight loss. So you don't have much power. Anything else? Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you.